RCR with Paul Brennan, Reality Check Radio. Friday morning at RCR is our political <clears throat> panel morning. Joining me, Marty Gibson. Hey, Marty. Oh, good morning. How are you doing? Good. Cam Slater, The Crunch. Good morning. How are you? I'm good, thanks. And Olivia Pearson. Uh, good morning, Paul. Nice to be here again. Notice I was kind of more gentle with your name. Yes, you were, because I'm such a lovely female. I, I don't want to, hey. uh, you know, I don't want to like, be too toxic sounding. Oh, oh no, we don't, we don't mind a bit of toxic masculinity, as long as it's the right kind. In the morning. All right, we're here to talk about some of the um, political shenanigans, goings on, issues, whatever you want to say. Uh, let's get straight into it. And what's all this about uh, 16-year-old voters in local body elections? That's a, that's a new one on me. Came out yeah. of the blue. Well, on Wednesday night, Kieran McAnulty um, pushed through uh, or introduced a new bill under urgency. They considered, um, this is the new bill, it's called the Electoral Lowering Voting Age for Local Elections and Polls Legislation Bill. Who comes oh, up with those names? Oh, honestly. So oh. genius. Locked into that little bill is a, a new category of electors youth electors, and it provides an, a separate role for them, a new youth electoral role, uh, to vote in council elections, and it provides for 16-year-olds and 17-year-olds to be registered on that role so that they can vote in local body elections. So why a separate role? Well, I, I don't know why. There's no explanation. There's no press release from the government. You know, Normally when they're heralding new bills that are going to do amazing things, they normally, you know, put out all these press releases. They seed it with the media. They uh, they do a big rah rah. Have their social media, but this has been kept very quiet. There's no reports of this anywhere in any of the media that are out there, except us, of course. And um, you know, if you're listening to my show yesterday afternoon, I did a mad rant about this. It beggars belief that we're letting a, a generation or an age group of people that are worried about the planet boiling in, in a few years and uh, at the same time can't work out whether they're a boy or a girl and we're going to get let them vote in local council elections. It's just insanity. It's crazy. Well, they're not gonna, 16 year olds aren't going to go out and vote in local body elections. So is this the thin end of a wedge? Well, well I mean, you, you can chuck into that one. Yeah. I, I, the only reason that they're going to, Jacinda Ardern always made promises about bringing down the voting age, didn't she? I remember that being one of her policies or things she was campaigning for back in 2021 around that time. And I mean, this is how they're doing it a little bit by stealth is that they get them voting at the local body level. And, and then in a couple of years time or next time that they're in government, hopefully they'll be out for a very long time, but they'll do a big campaign to make it an election lowering of the age for, for voting for the general election. And they'll say, well, they've already um, voted at the local body level, so why not let them go this far? It's very cynical because, you know, Labour and Greens have always been behind this idea of lowering the voting age, and that's because they want young people indoctrinated in climate alarmism to vote. It's that simple. I'd go back. I'd go upstream even from, from that, Olivia, and say so that uh, the, the part of the plan that goes before that is ensuring that we've got a an education system that leaves over fifty percent of kids going through it functionally illiterate and innumerate. You know that's a that's a uh, an important piece of that too. Yeah, they want more clueless young people. Yeah, so, to so vote. not only can, the, you know they can't read, but they certainly can't um, read and understand, or the step above that, read, understand, and form a cogent argument against something well, no they, they certainly can't argue but i mean apart social. from that apart from that they don't pay tax they haven't got jobs they're brainwashed uh, um you, you know i mean they don't know anything about politics other than all the wokeified uh indoctrination they pick up in school i do actually think that there's uh, something very cynical about the whole of the great resets policies which all happen at a local body level and I think this mm. is another example, like the fifteen minute city. You know, they're bringing things in at the local level. If, if you see, if you sorry, if you, right. if you see something like this come in, you can normally go back to the WF website and find its counterpart there. Yeah, 
I haven't uh, tried with this, um, but certainly with the um, gender pay gap, that's right there. Uh, it's it, it, there's always a counterpart. As I said, these uh, these guys are a, a screen and a keyboard. Hitler Youth, yeah. remember Hitler Youth? Mm. Yeah. Well, not remember, but that was a useful tool, right? Yeah. Funny, my daughter and I were talking about this the other day. How you know, corrupt totalitarian governments, authoritarian style governments, always want the youth, don't they? Well, they well, do terrible creepy, things. Yeah, there's that creepy tendency to talk about how they're looking forward to these baby boomers dying off, you know? And, and you often hear people on the left saying that you'll be gone soon. And there's that smug, and we've got the kids. Uh, oh, that's unsaid, awful. But, mm. yep. um, how about well, a thank you for building such a secure platform to have such a great life? Just, well, uh, they, the thing is, is they... Um, they're not taught they, gratitude at school, Paul. No. no, but they're not taught anything at school. The the <laughs> the problem is though is that you're talking about you know the the boomer generation being exterminated. Well, hello, what's happening now? Mm. There's not a big difference between oh, I can't wait for these people to die and I can't wait for these people to die. I've got to build some camps. <laughs> mm. But uh, yeah, I think I think this is just an outrage on behalf of the government. Uh, they're sneaking something through under urgency just a few weeks out from the election. Um, do you, any of the panel members have any confidence that Christopher Luxon and Nicola Willis will will overturn this, or will they think, you know, in their you know woke wonderfulness, the, the sopping wet trousers they've got from standing in their own puddle all day? Do you think they'll overturn this? Because I don't. Of course not. No. Of course not. Did they vote on it? Um, well, it, you know, they've got a majority of the Labour Party, so they can just shove that through under urgency. It goes to the third reading next week when I'm sure it'll be passed. Yeah. There's Have been no coverage of everything? no That's coverage of any of their comment, though, in the media um, up to that well, I've seen up it. to this point that we're talking about it. They're in on it. Mm. Mm. The mainstream media are in on it. This will be the only thing, this will be the issue that only um, Reality Check Radio covers. Because the others are in on it. Who is this Karen <laughs> McNulty? Wow. This creepy stare. John Ansel knows who he is. <laughs> I've seen her interaction. Or should I say Karen knows who John Ansel is? But what, what's his background? I know nothing about him. I know he's wired it up, but, you know, um, and he's he's got a beard. I know that. And he well, wears he shoes that are too big for away. him. I he know was, that. But... He, he was so – he was one of those – he first came to my attention when they were pushing the vax really hard to the young, you know, bribing them with um, candy floss and stuff like that. Remember those days in 2020. And Kieran was right behind that kind of thing. Hence him getting assaulted by, not assaulted, accosted is the word, by John Ansel, which was rather lovely. Outside his caravan. <laughs> yeah, his well, bus, whatever it was. His um, His claim to fame is that he was a bookie for the TAB. Yeah, oh. Bachelor of Arts. Yeah. <laughs> His master's thesis was titled The Role of Political Positioning in Party Performance in the 2008 general, New Zealand general election. I wonder what position he, he took. TAB. Missionary. Uh, and uh, it, it's reported that he was involved in the absconding of press gallery drinks in the boot of a car at some point. Man, there's something about a stare that just bothers me. You watch him next time he's being he opens his eyes real wide and doesn't blink. <laughs> Maybe well, it's the PCP or something like that. You know, ma magic mushrooms. One well, can the only people hope... of Wire Apple like him, obviously. Ding 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 ding. Mm, one can only hope that very few sixteen year olds will take much of it an interest in local body politics. It's quite difficult to do even as an adult. But what happens, let's say all that goes through. There's an election which is a close run thing, and it's determined by 16-year-olds. How yeah. does the country cope with that? Well, how does the local um, local body elections, how does the, the councils cope with that when you've got screaming 16-year-olds throwing a penny? Yeah, but people don't vote in local body elections, so we don't have to worry about that. But at a national scale. Well, they, they're not, they haven't implemented that, but you just... Uh, no, but they will, you, right? They will. Absolutely. You know, they're addicted to um, increasing their little group of, you know, controlled uh, automatons 
uh, by any means possible. So, you know, just like they're addicted to new taxes, they'll do this. They'll roll this out across the country and then we'll have 16-year-olds um, not only blocking up the streets on school days, but they'll also be um, voting and causing complete mayhem in the electorate. Okay, have we got anything more to say about that? Just watch the space and we'll have yeah, to fight what... it. When do they try and put it out to the general election? A, a whole lot of kids recently won a court case in Montana blocking development because of its implications with climate change. So that's mm. the next step. Mm, yeah. And that's been cheered and it's set a precedent. That's coming here, you know, so. Coming to a country near you. Yeah, child soldiers. Okay. Child climate soldiers. Oh, dear. <laughs> Where do we go next? Well, you know, stay local with here. I think, you know, we had last week the government, you know, telling us that they're going to take GST off fresh fruit and vegetables and, you know, we're going to implement that. And, and frozen. Don't and, leave the yeah, frozen Frozen, out. yeah, but in 2026 is when they're going to do that. So it was an announcement of a p- potential announcement and they didn't know anything about how it was going to work. And here we are seven days later. And they've just announced. Uh, they just announced yesterday that uh, they're going to put a twelve cents a litre tax on fuel, so that they can build twenty billion dollars of new roads, cycleways, and other things that they've never delivered in their entire time in in uh, in the last six years. But here we are. We're going to whack a new tax on for you all. And they announced it without even a shred of sort of shame or. Uh, self-consciousness. Self-consciousness that the the five dollars a week savings from GST uh, has now just been wiped out if you fill your fuel tank up each week, because a twelve cents a litre tax, uh, of course, is uh, six dollars for a fifty litre tank to fill up, six dollars extra in tax, and then they'll whack GST on top of that as well. So your savings from their GST policy have been wiped out and then some by these clowns. Yeah, they, I mean, they may as well just leave food alone. Well, Why the obsession with roads? Why are they so obsessed with roads, all of these people? Because well, they don't the like Labor, cars. That They hate cars, but mm. the Labor Party knows that they're on a losing proposition, particularly in Auckland, when the reality is it's the only way you can get around this place is by using cars. And cars use roads, and even your, um, you know, gay little electric vehicles need roads to operate on. Um, but we've any- got roads. Well, yes, exactly. But but we need bigger roads, particularly in Auckland. We need more roads. I mean, has anybody ever tried to get through the Green Lane roundabout uh, at five o'clock? Yeah, it's impossible. It, it's right? bad at three o'clock. Mm. Yeah, like people say to me, "Oh, can you come to a meeting?" Uh, in town at three o'clock, and my answer, no, that'll be no, no. Mm. My meetings occur between ten and two, and even the two o'clock one, I'd really like that to be at one, so I can get out of the place. Mm. Like going into town, most Aucklanders want to go into town like they want to catch cancer. Yeah, they're very expensive though roads, and we don't have much disposable as a country at the moment. Do you know what's more expensive than roads? Tell me, trains. <laughs> And nobody uses them. Like they want to have, you know, they've these pipe dreams of light rail to Albany, where they couldn't even build light rail to Mount Ross School. But apparently, we're going to have light rail to Albany. We're going to poke some tunnels through under the harbour, put light rail, and everyone's going to take it. No, they won't, because they don't. But I mean, go. They're, they're just they're always saying they're going to do things, especially in election year, and they don't do them, do they? Because they're they're too incompetent, and they. Um, everything I don't know. They just don't seem to give us anything that's useful. How about twenty billion on the health system? Build some new hospitals. Get that well, sorted out. Well, instead of spending the, I'd much rather have this, that than roads. Didn't they, they, saying that. Uh, yeah, but you come from Wellington, so you're going to say that. No, I spent five years in Auckland. <laughs> I, I'm across it. I know, but you know, it's where you spend your money when you don't have much of it. Well, there's a whole lot of things that uh, what have seen maybe so uh, they they spent billions upon billions upon billions of dollars on the COVID recovery fund. They could have built a hot. You know, they're still promising they're going to build five hundred million dollars on rat tests. Remember, five hundred million on rat tests, billions on all of that stuff. They promised a ho- new hospital for Dunedin. It's still in the ground. Uh, it hasn't even started. 
You've got, uh, I understand Labor is about to announce another new hospital. Um, you, you know, where's all this coming from? We're actually a poor nation now, not a rich nation, and they're spending like they're a rich nation. It's ridiculous. And also they don't have the staff to populate hospitals. They're struggling to fill the ones we've got. And they'd be better off looking at the causes or shall we say the main cause of why our hospitals are clogged with um, sick people with all these. Yeah, I wonder I, I oh. wonder what that could be. I, what I just, might that be, Cam? What, you what, what, what happened in the last three years that maybe? It's a mystery. That was a bit different. But a little bit different, and in you know we forced people to take that. And yep. did you think that's got anything? Candy, well, candy no, floss for the kids. KFC that worked a treat in South Auckland. KFC for some jabs. Yeah. They'll always do it. Mm. Mm. All right, so um, that's another that's another thing that will never be. Can another we go to America now. <laughs> oh, you love America, Olivia. I know. Yeah, Don't go you? go to America. Let's go, there go now. to America let's, now. Let's go. Well, I mean, it's just so, it's just the ongoing saga of you guys. Know you think what. we've got problems, right? You think, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, this is the, the country you want to see them rectified in. And if they're not rectified there, then there's not much hope for, for us all. But, um, you know, this, this saga continues with Trump's uh, indictment 4.0, um, the spiteful and malignant lawfare against Trump continues now and with 17 others, including um, Mark Meadows, who was Trump's last chief of staff, Rudy Giuliani, who everyone loves to hate, although he was a formidable... America's mayor. Yeah, America's mayor. And and that great uh, female lawyer, Sidney Powell, who, you know, had an incredible record as a um, an appeals lawyer. Um, so they've all been in, indicted, 17 of them, along with Trump in Georgia, on RICO charges. Well, they're the mafia. They're the mafia, don't you know? Yeah, so it's so it's just bizarre, isn't it? Because since apparently there was this grand conspiracy to overthrow the freest and fairest election that America's ever had, you know. <laughs> so um, nobody's ever actually seen RICO used in this way before, so it's been quite a shock to um, lawyers looking on. Um, and media are making much of the very small irony that Giuliani used the legislation um, to, you know, successfully go after the New York uh, mafia, the the five families, um, the Salernos, I think, were the top then. Um, and now it's been used on himself. So you're hearing a lot of this. Um, he's been hoisted on his own petard kind of stuff um, toward poor old Rudy. But um, the only irony really worth mentioning in this vein is that Trump and the other 17 brave souls who kept asserting that the 2020 election fraud happened in an extremely widespread way um, that is still not understood by the average American voter. It was industrial level fraud. Every which way that votes could be defrauded, they were defrauded from dead people on the voting registrars through to USB cards flipping the votes on the machines at precinct level. Um, it was a very wide net cast in the six battleground states for fraud. And Georgia was um, the most obvious, I think, because it was so caught on film. Remember the suitcases being pulled out from under That's the table? That's right. How can you even explain that away? You know, while the Republican scrutineers were sent home. Yeah. Um, and then there was a water at um, State Farm Arena. The, anyway, um, it just goes on the, and on. Oh, the water leak. <laughs> the water leak at State Farm Arena, yeah, which was nothing more than a leaky urinal, urinal, however you say that word. So you actually have a crime family here, the Biden crime family, getting Trump and those other brave souls standing with him on RICO charges. Uh, and just to remind everybody that RICO stands for Racketeer Influenced and Corrupt Organizations Act. So seriously, the whole White House and intelligence agency should be put on RICO charges for protecting a crime family with its boss, you know, the big guy, still walking around snorting coke with dementia and, and pretending that he's a president. You know, but no, they're going after the clean president who actually won the election. Well, I, I, did you hear uh, Glenn Beck saying that they're basically uh... – two main reasons that they were doing this. And, you know, Trump's facing 91 federal charges, remember. Um, 700 years in prison. Up, although they'd, they'd take that. 
But he said the main thing is deflecting from the muck that's coming out on the Biden crime family to keep that out of the news. And um, the second the second one is just as a caution to anyone who wants to mess with them. You know, if we can do this to an ex-president, imagine what we can do to you. Um, Absolutely. Uh, did you see Jonathan Turley is an American legal scholar? Um, yeah. Says this is the first criminal indictment of alleged disinformation. Yeah, um, yeah. When are they going to? When are they going to? Pro- um, when are they going to prosecute Fauci under the RICO stuff? Well, well, I mean, if um, Rand Paul gets his way, but uh, you, you'll never do anything with Merrick Garland as Attorney General. He's just, he's just such a awful human. He's yeah. got the creepiest voice. And he's, as we've said before, he's Biden's little bitch um, that he can sick on anyone and does with abandon. But uh, regarding the RICO aspect, I want to say this again. Nobody has ever seen RICO used in this way before. This is a new one. Um, It's a new aspect of lawfare. Um, And uh, Tim Palatore, he's um, a former Trump attorney. He was saying that um, on the upside, one of the things that really jumped out at him is something that they call continuity, where the enterprise on a RICO charge has to have some continuous purpose um, as opposed to just being an isolated incident. And he said that as this is an isolated incident, it's one election and it all centers around one election. It doesn't actually meet the RICO standard and he believes it'll just be dismissed. But remember, the point is not to get these things properly uh, litigated. Yeah, it's just to it's, dog Trump. It's to take him out of play. But look, at the, the same sort of stuff is happening here in New Zealand too, and people don't pay attention. And, you know, just uh, the last two days, for example, there's been the the donors in the donations case that the SFO took, you know, against uh, National Party donors, Labour Party donors, right? They've been appealing their sentences uh, and... What people don't even realise, because the media hasn't covered it, is that the same sort of gerrymandering with charges and then how the cases are conducted has happened here, where the Labour Party donors, who we remain nameless and are suppressed, and one of them was a, we can't even say what that person was, actually, um, they, they all got off, and it says in the judgment from the judge, they all got off because the serious fraud office never went and got an independent valuation for the artworks that they said were sold at an inflated value. And so the judge said, well, you can't prove that they haven't been sold at an inflated value. You've got no evidence to show what the real value was, so I have to acquit them. The judge said that in the judgment. Was that reported anywhere? No, not at all. So we've got the ruling party's functionaries and donors getting off on trumped up charges that should never have been taken in the first place because the serious fraud office just forgot. Oh, oops, forgot to get a valuation for the artwork. It's the same stuff. It's happening here as well as the United States. And your opening comment, Olivia, was just perfect. If the the, the bastion of the free world, which is what the United States is supposed to be, if they fall, yeah. so do we. Yeah, especially like this, because they they were so adamant from their inception that they were a nation of laws, not a nation of immigrants, a nation, a nation of laws. And that was such an important principle that to see them become, them fall this far, it's very much like, watch. it's very much like the time of Cicero, actually. Again, yeah. I say that. Because you're losing it is a, a civilizational collapse. The currency is getting debased. The immigrants are flowing in, and they've got no stake in the nation. They just want to see what's there. Well, it's all there. Well, let's, it just, can- let's just call this for what it is, right? Because you mentioned um, Cicero. This is nothing other than prescription, mm. which is what the Romans used to use when they made person an un- they made them an unperson, an uncitizen. You have to leave. Uh, you're not allowed to have fire and water within the boundaries of Rome, and you're prescribed. The state would take everything from you. They would deprive you of liberty, and you had basically 24 hours to get out of the boundaries of Rome, which, of course, we were expanding in, in Cicero's time. He he got caught on, on the road down 
you know, towards Naples. Um, well, I mean, they... but that's what they're doing to to Trump. They're prescribing him. They're tying him up with all of this stuff, uh, essentially locking him up, uh, mired in legal legal battles, so he can't fight the next election. Uh, aren't they risking a civil war? Yes. They yes. they be, because this is constitutional crisis level. That's that's where they're going. There's no, I mean, you know, they've had them before, but remember, probably remember the most probably the most famous constitutional crisis ever was the barons in what twelve fifteen England, when they got King John to sign Magna Carta, mm. and he signed it, and then immediately just dis, uh, ignored it. You know, you got <laughs> that's why you had the second barons' war as well. Yeah, that you got as the a result barons of it. war exactly. So you know that you actually you. They're very stupid to do this, and um, and a constitutional crisis. Look, it's probably what they need. But in 2020, that election was so obviously stolen. But look how far they're going to well, make sure that um, Trump is not allowed. No American will be allowed to accuse um, the government of fraud. That's he's, just he's, palpably he's, ridiculous. It's anti First Amendment. Everything. Well, where this heads, though, is these same laws being used on them. Yep. Well, that's what Alan Dershowitz said, right? You know, this mm. doesn't pass the banana republic test. If you took this to its logical conclusion, half of Congress would be in, in prison. Yeah. That'd be the end of Mitch McConnell for sure. Yeah. You, yeah. You know. Pity Dershowitz has been such a soft cock toward the left for all these years with his liberal policies and liberal aspects of law. You know what I mean? These people really annoy me. And then when they see the Republic get to this level, they're like, ooh, as if they're on our side. They're not. Too he's late. Not. There must anyway, be a lot. There must be a lot um, to hide. There must Lolly be a lot to hide. Express. There must be a lot to hide. For them oh, there's a lot to hide. I mean, there must imagine? be such an incredible amount of stuff to hide. And it must be very bad. Well, um, and this is the thing, too, is that Vivek Ramaswamy said on Twitter after hearing that the full, remember the Fulton County posted the indictment on its website when the yeah. grand jury Ahead was still time. convened? Yeah, I mean, this is like so... Like they, it was already choreographed, but they got the timing wrong. Well, well that's, that's, the, that's the fixes in, as Lindsay said on his show, and he got that bang on. And But Vivek was saying that, um, you know, Trump should... Since the four prosecutions against Trump are using novel and untested legal theories, like RICO, um, it's fair game for him to do the same in his defense. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and right. so uh, Vivek was saying that he should immediately file a motion to dismiss. And Mark Levin came out and said that um, they actually need to appeal to the Supreme Court to stop this because it's obvious election interference. Mm. Yeah, there's a term he used uh, uh, what was the term? I've got it written here. I wrote it down. He's yeah, but I mean, it's it's amazing the extent to which the the uh, the Biden story is coming out. You know, they've got their money guy now, whose name escapes me as well. Um, and and there's about twenty million dollars in in um, bank uh, transfers going to various um, the Biden. big guy, the big yeah. guy, the, the big pillow guy, guy. the big guy, it, it's, big guy. Um, oh, the, oh, the big guy. <laughs> <laughs> the one with dementia. And, 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 yeah, these indictments are filed very quickly after something new comes out. So oh, yeah. every, Again, the next day. Yeah, bringing it home to New Zealand, just the silence from the media here really uh, brings it home to me how, um, yeah, we're riding this all the way down. How yes. secure are our elections? Oh, we've had this conversation. No, no, before. but you got to ask. You got to no, ask. I think they are. I mean, you know, I've been involved in elections since I was in nappies. Well, um, you reckon Podesta meant when he said that it's ripe for a juicy hack um, just before the 2000 and was it 2020 or 2016 he visited here? Yeah, I remember that. Look, I, it, it's just Pedro too Podesta. hard. It's just too hard because there's too many, you know, we, we, we have scrutineers in all the booths. Yeah, so, I know we've been through this. I know we've exactly. been through this before. It's but... too hard because the everybody in the major political parties knows what the numbers are. So they know what they are in the booths. So they know and so how do you hijack that between the booth and the returning officer? Yeah, but look what happens when you say that it's it's been rigged. Look what look what it's so obvious the video's there in America, everything's there. It's not enough. Yeah, but but Paul, honestly, in New Zealand, you couldn't do it. I you guess just, you just get all the, the two major parties to do virtually the same thing, and so it doesn't really matter. 
Well, the, I read the, I I read a really interesting document the other day. It was really really long, but it was it was the discovery of exactly ha- the mechanism of how they did the fraud in in, mm. in the states in the six battleground states especially. Mm. Um, and it was at precinct level, and it was the flipping of the votes on the machines. Well, we don't use um, machines. No, I was going to say so unless our system runs in that same way it that doesn't. they did. Um, yeah, okay. and well, from what Pam's that, explained, it's quite different. No, okay. Honestly, it's it's it, it's real conspiracy level stuff to talk about it in New Zealand. For a start, you know, we we got too many people that that are involved in the process that no other people in would talk about it. You know, the only sort of level of fraud that goes on in voting in New Zealand is plural voting, where someone, you know, I don't know, like oh, Martin Bradbury in one of the elections was registered as Martin Bradbury spelled with a Y and Martin Bradbury spelled with an I. Now, I'm not accusing him of fraud, but he was on the electoral roll twice, right? So vote early and vote often. That's the Labour Party's refrain, <laughs> vote early and vote often. There yeah, was, the, fam- it, it there was can, the famous you- only hunger case where they had 42 people living at one address and they all happened to vote Labour, you know, so... But Cam, Winston would Peters you... won, a, won, a, won an electoral um, petition based on fraudulent um, plural votes in, in uh, Hunua. I still live there. Mm. Um, but Cam, would you say that it's impossible in New Zealand, or would you just say it was it was not likely? It's very, very, very hard. I don't know. I watched um, Oppenheimer film last week, and they were doing all these calculations about whether or not the letting the bomb off in the atmosphere would set the atmosphere on fire. And the best they could come up with was there's a very, very, very almost zero chance of it happening. And the, the general says, well, can't you make that zero? And he goes, oh, it's theoretical. We need to do it in practice and see what happens. <laughs> so it's a it's a very small chance that it could be done in New Zealand, but I just don't – I don't believe it's – There's feasible. there's more low-hanging fruit. Okay. Well, the, we, we don't need to. You end up with MMP. <clears throat> you can hijack the system that way with MMP. Yeah. All right. So we move on to the polls. Back to New Zealand. Yeah. And are we done with the US? I think so. I just, I just wanted to say one little thing. One. Okay. T- and that was uh, what Mark Levin uh, was saying. He was, and we've made this observation before ourselves. But it's the process that's the killer, right? And yeah, they yeah. know it. Yeah. And they're playing the process by unloading all these indictments by taking Trump off the campaign trail, by depleting his resources and by influencing voters, um, you know, and that's, it's just a, to tarnish smear and besmirch him I think all the way backfire. through the election. I think it's going to backfire too. I really do. In a massive way. Like his name recognition will be huge. People, people like to have people to have a fair go. And they'll be sitting they there going, and they'll be sitting there going, "Come on, this is un- this is unbelievable. We need yeah. to teach the Democrats a lesson." And there'll be a bloodbath at the next election. Yeah, and it's well, as it's long as not... it's at the election and not on the streets. And and the other thing is, you know, the man, Trump is an extremely loved president. You know, he can't go to a boxing match without being adored. He can't walk into a stadium without being adored. He can't go anywhere without people just swamping him, love bombing him. I've never seen, I've never seen, I never saw Obama treated that way, ever. There is one problem, though, Operation Warp Speed, just saying. But maybe we should um, move on. Oh, no, that's easy to, that's easy to. Well, he's still. uh, That's easy to explain. He's still behind it, endorsing it. So that's a problem. Anyway, the polls. Mm. Back home, the polls. Are they, Cam, you know about all the polls. Are they sitting about where you thought they'd be right now? No, uh, all the polls are kind of aligning and it's looking like uh, a a national act, New Zealand first across the line in opposition to the government parties and the racists and the Maori party. Um, I would would have expected, firstly, that Christopher Luxon would be ahead in preferred prime minister polls. Um, The best he's done is draw level with Christopher Hickens in one poll. Uh, He should be ahead. Um, you could have a situation where he becomes the Jim Bolger, the modern Jim Bolger, who wins an election by accident, uh, mm. despite having negative favourables. Um, he still ended up prime minister, but that was under first past the post. I think national 
uh, probably five to uh, eight points shy of where they should be. Um, this close to an election with a well, with that's a, quite a bit that's, with that's a, with a hated and despised government, um, and you can pin that down to the lackluster performance of you know Christopher Luxon and all his woke um, pals that are helping him there. You know Chris Bishop and Nicola Willis and all of them just totally wet and woke. You know it, they they're moving around with a self sustaining puddle that keeps all of their trousers damp. Um, but and and we're seeing in the votes that the people in the polls that people are starting to respond to politicians that are saying enough of this BS. We're sick of this woke stuff. Um, we're going to start making a stand against uh, all of this woke ideology, particularly the trans stuff. And and you know the person who's come out the strongest on that uh, in the last couple of days has been Winston Peters, who's actually got a policy that says. We're not going to allow uh, biological men in in women's changing. Areas. He put it in a particular way, I think, Cam. Yeah, yeah. He actually used the p word. He said, uh, "We're not going to have people with penises in these um, in these rooms." And it, he was emphatic. And then he went further to say that we're not going to have it in in women's sports either. And if you are a sport in New Zealand and you are uh, creating uh, a a place where biological men can uh, compete on supposedly an equal footing with women, then we're not going to give you any more government funding. And I think that is a brilliant and brave policy. And, and there'll be uh, thousands and thousands of voters who were saying, finally, at last. I mean, you know, you had Gavin Hubbard, who changed his name to some girly name, uh, and tried to compete as a woman because he was literally tits as a man at weightlifting. He didn't even rate anywhere, and all of a sudden he becomes the top, you know, female supposedly weightlifter. And we're all sitting there incredulous, but these sports allowed it. We've got that the the bloke who's um, who's uh, changed his name and grown a pony table tail and is now you know riding in mountain biking and cleaning up all of the female records and that. It's that people think this is happening oh, overseas right. and it's not happening in New Zealand. It's happening here. And we, it, we need to say no. We need to say stop. And it's the politicians that are saying enough that are going to start seeing their vote climb because everyone else is sick of the wokeness. I, I totally agree with that, Cam, because so many people, they just want to see someone stand up for something that was sensible. And, you know, these boomers that didn't have a world like this had a really good world, actually, um, before the next generations really, really cocked it up for them. Um, yeah, they just want normalcy again. And all this stuff is so far out of the Overton window of normalcy that it's just frightening. Um, and Winston saying that is brave. I mean, who would have thought that would be a brave thing to say? What a sad time we're living in when that's considered mm. brave. But it is. And um, compared to Nicola Willis, you now, know, wasn't just, that just simpering wet drippiness from her? Absolutely. Well, it, that's it is. It's they're, they're they're wet behind the ears, and you know she refused to take a sensible position. Um, and this is remember, this is men impersonating women in order to have access to women's everything, sports, bathrooms, and you know everything else that women hold sacred. So that is to say that Nicola's taking a uh, taking a that's to say that in not taking a position, she is taking a position, and that is that she and National are fine with this irrational and quite evil cultural nonsense. They're going uh, along to get they're going along to get along. Yeah, and, but, and, and yeah. this needs to end. So did stormtroopers, didn't they? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> exactly. They don't want to yeah. punch that tar baby. I know, but you know. What about um, court, um, what about um, the issue of Luxon and is it Pink and the Tova O'Brien comments? He's thrown another one of his colleagues under a bus. There was Maureen Pugh, I remember. And he's kind of done it again. Mm -hmm. Not, not, not and very Simon good with the loyalty, the in si public loyalty. And Simon O'Connor, you know, it used to be the National Party prided itself on people uttering, you know, different views, and the leader would say, "Oh well, you know, 
that's just Fred we're being a Fred. Yeah, we're a broad church. So that's just Fred being Fred. But no, now we get the tut tut, the finger mm, wagging. Mm, you know, the yeah. oh no, that's not something that uh, I've had words with Simon. I've had words with uh, with Mister Pink. Oh, um, it's he, all so heavy, isn't and it? And then you get the cringy apologies. You know, I'm so so <laughs> so sorry. You know, they're not sorry. And uh, just don't apologize. Of they're not for it. sorry. Mo- move on, and the nutters will be outraged about something else. And and let's face it, it was just the media lovies that were upset that their skinny little, you know, um, failure of a of a journalist and radio host, um, you know, got smacked in the chops by by a politician. Yeah, you know? yeah. What, what did he actually say? I didn't catch it. I think he uh, said that she caved the ratings for Today FM, and that's what took him out. But well, she pretty you, you much could did. argue that you could actually argue that. <laughs> but even even Mark Latham has um, had to go from Pauline for from One Nation, and you remember the comment he made about the homosexual. <laughs> what was it? Oh, don't you? I can't say it on air, but I'll send oh. it to you later because <laughs> it's just so ball bouncingly funny. <laughs> Um, and and Mark Latham won't back down, but I think Pauline Hanson had to send him on his way eventually because it was what just, a shame. It, it was a real shame actually because he's allowed his view, and I, you know, I, I appropriate his saying. You know, his description of the Australian Labor Party as a conga line of suckholes. Every opportunity I get to describe New Zealand's Labor Party, <laughs> the suck, suckholes. You know, the, yeah. but. But this all kind of in New Zealand kind of starts back in 2014 when, you know, Nicky Hager wrote Dirty Politics. He tried to shame everybody into not talking to me, um, tried to shame. Nicky Hager comes up in every one of our shows. He really does. He's always he's like, and now introducing well, he's the Nicky fight. Hager spot. He's got a face you could punch all day long, though. But the point, <laughs> but the point I'm making is is that this cringy, you know, getting people to apologise for something that they said or did in the past, um, that was all in New Zealand. It kind of all started with that. You know, I got question after question. I, you know, are you going to say sorry to the prime minister? No, I'm not. Mm. You know, I expect the prime minister to come out and say, "I'll talk to whoever I want," just like John Howard did. In Australia, when they were attacked over the exclusive brethren, John Howard said, "Well, the exclusive brethren, they're members of they're citizens of Australia, and I talk to all citizens." But no, John Key didn't do that. He went all whiny and whiny. And that solves it. Just saying that, right? Exactly. I mean- yeah. Exactly. But but as soon as you play their game, they make you apologise. Then they carry on. And then, oh, now he's apologised, he's admitted he's wrong, so he has to lose his job as well. Oh, absolutely. It's totally manipulative. It's, it's, um, it's the pussy whipping of politics, actually. This yeah. this is uh, female nonsense. It's d- demanding everybody apologize because your feelings are hurt all the time. It's so bad, but it's so... In fact, that's what women have brought to politics in the last 100 years is this really um, wet, whiny apologitis that is now so normal that it's a shock when someone won't apologise, and I can't bear it. I just can't. I, I don't it. know if you caught uh, Marie Busky's uh, counterculture interview with Josh Slocum, who writes the Disaffected newsletter. That's worth listening to. He's he's talking about um, cluster B personality disorders, and how they basically infected politics, and it's infected. You know, he's basically saying the people involved in these in these things like trans rights don't care about trans people feminists don't care about women they 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 want to get they attention. want to fight they want to fight yeah and, and that's where the apology partly comes from it is from this you know person person the personality disordered people that we've left we've left in charge of us and in charge of the media and nobody, I mean, do you, uh, as as a human being, if I can see someone's apologizing to me and doesn't mean it, it actually just makes me angrier. I it's would rather worse. than, yeah, it's worse, save it. And, um, you know, an apology, there's nothing wrong with a heartfelt apology that you do because uh, you're not proud of your behavior or whatever. That's quite different. Mm. But this is just manipulative and weak and emotionally um, undeveloped. I mean, he what he could have said is, well, what bit of what my colleague said is untrue. Exactly. Yeah. Because <laughs> it's, that's what happened. Okay, just quickly on staying kind of loosely with the polls, um, I've seen an uptick, could just be me, in what I would call the hit pieces 
Well, mainly on Winston. You know, like yeah. he's engaging with woo woo la la candidates. Is that a sign that there's a fe- feeling of being threatened? The system is fighting back, right? And the, and they fear Winston because he knows how the system works and he knows how to unpick things. And they they want to control the narrative, especially the media. And that's why you see, you know, Hosking, Hosking's misses. Uh, What's Hosking and the misses got skin in this game? What does it matter to them? Well, I don't know. But then you have a look at Heather Depressus Allen attacked Winston. You've got another piece yesterday by um, Hosking um, attacking Winston Peters. You've got Stephen Joyce having a piece in the Herald um, attacking Winston Peters. There's a concerted effort out there. Oh, to, absolutely. To Richard try, Preble. Yeah, Richard <clears throat> Preble, uh, the guy who founded the ACT Party, um, attacking Winston Peters. And nobody says, well, hang on, of course they'd say that. It is a campaign, but they're as demented as the Democrats. It's like Axe banners yeah. that they put out, right? See, David Seymour thinks that's hilarious. Um, nobody's actually sat him down to explain that those billboards actually now look like Winston's billboards. And yeah. and all the people who see them are going to go, gee, that, that's a that's a good point that that nice Mr. Winston Peters has said there. And he looks so smart in that double-breasted suit. And, and look at a that, nice smile. And look at that smile. It looks, oh, it just he's just always oh, a silver fox. Oh, I can't be mad at you. Yeah. And we don't get fooled again. That's a <laughs> who song that yeah, people we, know what that song means. Yeah, and we won't get fooled again. We're not going to vote for the National Party. We're not going to vote for the Act Party. We're not going to vote for Labour. We won't get fooled again. We'll vote for you, Winston. And that's what David Seymour has failed to understand by attacking Winston. We well, can't run a country if you're that dumb, can you? Well, but, but also that, um, what's her name? I'm sorry, the blonde with the, um, oh, Kate Hawksby. Her her hit pieces that she keeps doing. Yeah, that's that's, that's it's um, pure Hoskins pearl. Misses. Oh, that's, oh, yeah, that's the missus. They sound um, remarkably similar, those two. Isn't have it? You know? Like she's, it's, it's. Ooh, oh. Those two have got the same voices. Well, but it's the same thing when you see on, on Twitter or X as it's called now where somebody says something positive about Winston Peters and you, and you get some fool who comes in with, uh, he he was the one who selected our oh, that one. You know, they ignore that 440,000 National Party voters from 2017 all ticked the Labour Party. Is that media programming? Is that media programming? Well, when yeah. people say that, yeah, because it's almost like line word for word. No, it's na- no, it's national party programming. Oh, okay. uh, they they have this pathological hatred of Winston Peters, no matter what, and they will say things like, you know, insane things like, "Oh, well, he selected uh, Jacinda Ardern," and then if you challenge them and you say, "Well, okay, on that basis, did Winston Peters select Jim Bolger in 1996?" Oh, no, 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 that was a coalition negotiation. This is the insanity of the thinking of these people who are hostile. They <clears throat> they come out with these lines, and then when you actually point out some salient facts to them, then they just resort to, oh, well, he just tells lies. Well, well, well so does every politician. You know? That other, um, that interview you did, you did with uh, Lee Donoghue, right? Um, yeah. Shortland Street actor, a national, uh, NZ First candidate, was was really revealing in, in terms of the degree to which that decision was shared among the board and the members and Winston Peters. I hadn't thought of that. And it's like, well, these are the guys, it's their party. It's not like he's making an arbitrary decision by himself. He, uh, and I, that's I think, exactly right. And that, and people say, oh, he selected, he chose. No, the caucus got together, the board got together, and they decided that, well, Bill English didn't have anything to offer. He wasn't negotiating. This is the best deal that we can get for our voters, and that's how it happened. Yeah, surely the thing to come out of that is that one side was were very bad negotiators. <laughs> to Bill English was just t- negotiation. No. Yeah, you blew it, man. No, what, what do you say, Marty? Bill English could fall into a bucket of tits and come up sucking his thumb. Yeah, I said that about Luxon, but I guess it could. <laughs> I rate right, Bill English um, a bit more. We've run for quite some time, and I know we've got other issues, and we're going to have to be very kind of selective in the duration we have left. Have we got anything more to say about uh, the uh, fallout from the BlackRock deal? Is there anything to say about that? Uh, I, I haven't. Um... It's not a deal. For a start, it was a yeah. oh, an oh, announcement of a, an announcement that BlackRock was going to set up a a fund, a, a, a fund 
And, and and Hipkins had to admit that under question. He said, "Oh no, it's just an announcement." Yeah, yeah it's it's an announcement. But the thing the thing I'd say about that, and and I've said it before, is that the amount that that fund is about two billion is about what it's going to cost us to pay for our agricultural emissions every single year. Right. Thanks to James Shaw mincing around the world and begging for them to be included, despite the fact they're not in the Paris Accord. So, you know, rather than just take our good luck that we've got 80% plus renewables and, yeah, we're going to pay a bit less, they've got this, oh, we've got to do our part, you know, most of no. our emissions are agricultural, so yeah. include them. So if, if we hadn't have done that, we would have been able to use our own money to get to 100% rather than getting our sleeve caught in this... Um, this, Let's just put uh, it into perspective, uh, Marty, right? You, you're right. You're saying this fund, it's tiny. BlackRock is worth $10 trillion. Now, trillion sounds like billion, right? But there's a difference. A billion dollars is $1,000 million. A, a trillion is a million million dollars. Yeah. Ooh, so they've got $10 million million, and they're putting $2,000 million dollars into a fund, which it's Big Macs, chips, and a Coke to those guys. Yeah. 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 Everything we do for climate somehow has to involve shackling our descendants with debt to bankers who print the money. We that, don't that... want to be first. We, we shouldn't be first at anything other than um, the Rugby World Cup. We shouldn't be first, right? We should be maybe fast followers, but never first especially on things like climate change, because we'll just beggar ourselves trying to say we're first. And well, our settings are on the worst case scenario still, as I understand it. You know, yeah. we, we, the, the the predictions for the warming have gone backwards, despite that we're at the global boiling period, but we haven't adjusted our, our settings. Can I plant but, my pineapples and mangoes yet? <laughs> Well, I mean, you know, Cam, when we when when you you say fast follower, I think we're going to be fast following Sri Lanka. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, we'll be fast following Germany with that, their power going up five hundred percent. That because that's where the money is going to come from. It's going to be power prices skyrocketing. You know how yeah. we could lower our our power prices? Let's build a couple more coal power plants and dig the coal that we've already got here, so we don't actually have to buy it off to Indonesia. I tell you, I mean, you know, the days we used to fill up your trailers down at Huntley, come back, stick it in the, you know, that was my job with Dad. I loved doing stick that. Stick it in the Saturdays. bunker. Stick it in the bunker. Yeah, the bunker the with house. the little thing that lifts up. And I mean, that that held our, our coal all winter. And we know, used to get it in school. It was the, great. The, the coal guy would arrive and tip it in there, and that would fire up the boiler. And oh, the did you see radiators that? in the classroom would. Keep us all snuggy and yeah, warm. Yeah, it's part did, of doing your chores, you know. Did you see the, the news this, this week, though? There was um, all the schools have been told they have to get rid of all of their coal furnaces and they've put in all this electric heating. And they were, yeah. bleat, they were bleating about how their power bills have now skyrocketed. <laughs> like, yeah. who would have ever seen that coming? <laughs> no, and again, they could have bought the emissions to just keep those boilers for like $2,000 a year per school. Instead, it's it's cost them <laughs> yeah, But it's not a good look, though, is it, Marty? It's not a good look. We're not oh. doing we're not doing our, our bit. Oh. Right, so we need to be doing our bit. I want global warming, right? I want to be able to grow pineapples and mangoes in my back garden. Apparently you can. In Southland. Yeah. Oh, well, don't know about Southland, but <laughs> you, certainly in Northland it's possible. I know that. I talked to a guy who, who does it. It's it's completely doable. Good. So uh, get into that. it. Don't we hold need back. need to move that winterless north down to the winterless south. Might not be well, good Well, there the is evidence season. that Coomera used to grow around the Wairapa. So it would have had to have been warmer, I think, then. Sure. And that was, was you know. And, so it's, it's happened before. Yeah, say. I mean, the medieval warm period it would have been. That's That would have been... You're not allowed to talk about that. <laughs> it's just you a coincidence. It, yeah, stop doing that or you'll get put on I a I want you to apologise for that, please. That'll be a RICO charge. In public. Yeah, I'm Rico. so... <laughs> so so okay. um, we might not be able to get to the other issue, eh, Paul? Is that the um, the Chinese torture? Yeah, the, the court case that the Fulengong have bought. Oh, no, let's get into that. Let, let's, oh, let's we... do that too because okay, that's Okay, great. 
Yeah, it is very interesting. So this story came up recently, which, you know, I, I just thought was fascinating. Um, also quite heartbreaking, though, and I hope it does go to trial. Um, I'll try and be quick. Cisco Systems, Inc. is an American tech company that creates tracking and surveillance equipment that is then sold to the Chinese Communist Party. And it's used to persecute dissidents, most essentially Fulang Gong practitioners. Um, Fulang Gong are about the gentlest people on earth. But these systems are also used to track all dissidents, including Christians and, of course, Uyghur Muslims. Um, so the CCP use Cisco Systems, which, of course, has a 24-7 help desk troubleshoot. Um, so none of these pesky little dissidents can get away. The help desk is run from California. But, I mean, how flipping awful is this whole concept? Um, there has been a 12-year legal battle filed in California by Fulangong practitioners, um, that, and, and they were helped by human rights activists. Um, this could have very far-reaching consequences for all American companies that have sold tracking and surveillance tech into China. So Republican Representative Chris Smith, who's from New Jersey, and he chairs the Congressional Executive Commission on China, he has spent... 30, China. China. He has spent 30 years in Washington fighting for human rights, and he says that this case is long overdue and wrongly delayed lawsuit underscores the excruciating pain and suffering that corporations like Cisco enable by deliberately cooperating and turning a blind eye to the Chinese Communist Party and its inherent egregious human rights violations and repression in order to make a profit. Um, Cisco, of course, has denied any wrongdoing and has labeled the allegations baseless. But the U.S. Circuit Judge Marsha Benzon, uh, writing for the appellate court, has said that the plaintiffs had presented sufficient evidence to proceed to trial and that Cisco's actions amounted to aiding and abetting China's Fulangong repression and had a substantial effect on the commission of violations of international law, including torture. So the complaint alleges that at the heart of the claim, Cisco designs the tools, manufactures the components, and then provides ongoing assistance in the form of a help desk to the CCP, and that it largely all takes place out of California. Um, wow. so, any, so anyway, it's going. To, it looks like it's going to court, and now it's the U.S. Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. Uh, it was reversed at a lower district court back in 2014, but the decision to dismiss the claims against Cisco and John Chambers, its former chief executive, and Freddie Chung, the former vice president of its Chinese operations. So now it's it's coming back. And the three-judge appellate panel's July ruling um, did not determine the validity of the claims. Instead, that they said that the Fulangong practitioners had presented enough evidence for their case to proceed to trial in California where it was filed. So, of course, we can give everybody two guesses who the biggest, you know, who are big uh, funders, shareholders in Cisco Systems. Like to take a guess, Cam? Oh, oh um, uh, BlackRock and Vanguard? <laughs> well done. Go to the top. BlackRock uh, and Vanguard. I wonder what sort of calls they get to the help desk. Can you, yeah, I, can it, you imagine? It's not working. Oh, no. her, her all, I calling for information. I don't see anything. I'm dissident. Now stop being naughty, boys. Hello, get my whip out. Help desk. How can we help? Yeah. Yes. Oh, well, we've got one in our sites. What do I need Balangong, to do? Oh, not press, on screen. Yeah, yeah. Press this button, and you know your your sites will zoom up, and you'll get a larger <laughs> view. Oh no, he's gone into a cave. I mean, this is just so unhuman. Um, so I was so disgusted. But I'm really glad, and I hope this goes to court in America, because it will set a massive precedent for all the tech countries that you can't invent technology, sell it into China, and then persecute people that have their organs harvested from it, especially gentle people who do no harm. Um, well, that's the optimistic way of looking at it, Olivia. I mean, <laughs> a slightly darker way of looking at it is it's a trial run to bring it here. 
Well, of course they'll bring stuff like that. Somebody runs the credit social credit system, and of course they're going to want one for New Zealand and one for Australia and one for Canada and one for the states and. Yeah, but that's why these things need to be prosecuted. And it shows you how wicked these big corporate overlords are too. They really are smashers of human liberty and human flourishing. They don't care. If you can watch The Painkiller on Netflix, I'd recommend it. It's about the development of OxyContin. And you can sort of see it's a really good portrayal of corporate psychopaths and just how nefarious so many of those processes that these pharmaceutical well, we know uh, all about that. Is that Agents otherwise known as dope sick, Marty? Uh, I haven't seen that, no. Oh, because that's about OxyContin too. Yeah. And the, I wonder if it's the same series, but that was very, no, no, very good. It's a, it's, it's a dramatized. It's it's great. And so was this. Dope sick Pretty was... Pretty grim, but great. Any last words? Uh, you know, I, I was interested in, in just saying I saw Winston Peters interviewed um, you know, and, and he's he's really had his feet held to the fire, as you say, about Kirsten Murphitt, um specifically. And it's it's uh, given me an uneasy feeling at how crumbly he's been about the whole thing when he could so easily say, you know, as we were saying about the National Party leaders, hey, you know, you know, say, oh, you know, there's all these conspiracy theories like the WF's trying to control us. It's like, what's so hard about saying, hey, they are. <laughs> Our last two prime ministers have been WEF young global leaders. They're implementing their policies and the media won't talk about it. What's so hard about that? It it, it annoyed me that he, well, he, he didn't have a bit more ticker on that. Who who was that, Marty? I was, he was talking. Winston Peters was in, well, he's been interviewed by. On another uh, station. Yeah. Oh, Okay. Uh, Another another station with a smaller listenership and um, <laughs> much, oh, much, just, much smaller. Yeah, just generally um, a, a few other places. He's been equivocating a bit. And I think um, I don't want to. That's not what we need. No, it's not what we need. And but I will say this about Winston Peters. In, in the years that I've known him, he is an extremely cautious politician. And right. and for him to have actually agreed to have Kirsten as a candidate when she was part of another party. That's something that I've never seen Winston do before in 30 years. He values loyalty over anything else. And this is something that he would probably consider risky, um, but he's doing it anyway. He should have a look at those stats, New Zealand figures that have been released for the period from 1st of July 2022 to the 30th of June 2023, um, which were released, I think, this week. But, you know, they're showing that in the previous uh, 12 months, we've had uh, the deaths are up 14%. That's according to government's own data. He, he's uh, aware of those. Disabilities up 37%. Yeah, disability's up 37%. And, what could, what could uh, you know, have caused that, I wonder? Yeah, I what, wonder. what could? And, and even more, there's been a, a decrease of um, 28% in the natural live births. Yeah. There's plenty of material there where if someone tries to, to bombast you into – um, walking away from speaking the truth. In, the, in that interview that you were referring with. to, Marty, um, and Kirsten Murford, he was kind of walking that back. He was kind oh, of yeah. like, he was kind of walking her association with New Zealand First back yeah. a bit. Yeah, he was. He, he said, was saying, oh, we oh, haven't decided yet. These candidates <laughs> and, you know, they, they're not confirmed until September. Mm. Um, that's, a stand, that's a standard line from him. Well, mate, he needs to pull his socks up. Well, I don't know. You end up in a situation where you like can make Labor. a really bad mistake if the you, time you is wrong. You don't it? have to. You know, there's this talk of conspiracy theories. This isn't conspiracy. No, no theory. Forget, just forget that. Like, this is the risk that you take in in cementing it in early, and this is what is happening to the Labor Party right now. And it's probably exclusive uh, information here for Reality Check listener listeners out there. And that um, Nacy Chen, who's a Labour list MP who currently resides in Botany and is listed on their website as a Botany list MP, she was um, begged by the hierarchy in the Labour Party to put her name forward for Labour in East Coast Bays. And she agreed on the proviso that she would have a, a good list ranking. 
And uh, Labor released their list at the end of July. Uh, I think it was the 27th of July. And Nacy Chen is uh, listed at number 33. And uh, on current polling, it's barely likely that David Parker will make it back in on the list, and she certainly won't. So she, what she's done is thrown her toys out of the cot. Uh, she's not going to be a candidate at all in either Botany or in East Coast Bays. And now Labor has a real problem because they've got a few short weeks to handle uh, a number of selections for two electorates so that they can have a full uh, gambit of candidates. Because if they don't have a a, a candidate in every electorate, then the Electoral Commission uh, applies a formula and reduces their funding. And so Labor's got a real problem. And the real problem is because they cut a deal with somebody and then released their list and given her enough time to throw her toys out of the cot and leave them in a pickle. And that's the problem we have. And it's even worse in smaller parties to do that sort of thing because uh, smaller parties are really dependent on a whole lot of people taking a hiding for nothing in these electorates. But it's so very important for their funding from the Electoral Commission. Yeah, right. I'll label will be able to find a teacher or a union hack. I think oh, I'm sure formula. they will, but but that's the risk you, you run. And it's a really bad risk to undertake if you're a small party because your potential pool of candidates to tap on the shoulder to take one for the team is really, really small. Mm. All right. Okay, well, I think we're done. done. Yeah. Yeah. Um, another well, political panel. Well done, and you have been. <laughs> I want to thank uh, Marty Gibson. Thank you, Marty. Hey, thanks for having me. Thank you, Cam. Great to be here. Hopefully Olivia, I'll be here next week. Always a pleasure. Ah, uh, You're welcome, Paul. We'll do it all again next week, next Friday. We shall. If we're still here. Week. Yeah. Well, we've got a higher chance of being here than another radio station. RCR with Paul Brennan, Reality Check Radio.